Good morning. morning. Hope you had a great week. It's great to see you this weekend. And I want to say a special thanks to all who serve at Bay Community, all four campuses. Everybody did such a great job. You know, and it's remarkable what took place last weekend. Over 280 people gave their lives to Christ. That's just really, that's worth a hand clap of thanks to the Lord. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Revelation chapter 1 and to John chapter 13. Revelation 1, John 13. Uh, I would remind you, um, we do have a, a mission trip coming up at the end of May, a youth trip to Honduras. I think it's filled up. But we have another trip in July to Uganda, and we have a, a wonderful couple there that we work with and support. They have a Christian school, so whether it's education or construction or children, uh, we have a team going in July, so check that out on the website if you'd like to go. We'd love for you to experience it. And I've been there. It's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful location. Well, last weekend we started a new series entitled Face, it, Face to Face. And, you know, I said, well, God's divine and we're human, so how do we discover who he is, how he acts, you know, what he likes? And I think it begins by looking at Jesus. And our best illustration of Jesus uh, is, is in the Gospels, in, in, in specifically in the book of John, where we're going to look in this series. And we're going to look at face-to-face encounters that so many people had that tra- transformed their lives. Last weekend, Easter weekend, we looked at Mary Magdalene. If you missed that, you can go online and pick it up and, and watch it again. I'm going to refer to a few things in it so it kind of laps a little bit. This weekend, I want to look at John, the, the apostle, one of the 12 disciples. I want to look at John's story I want to start in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, and I want you to just follow along and listen to this. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of God, clothed with garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sounds of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Uh, I, I just translate that as... If that had been me, I'd have passed out, okay? It had been over. I just, boom. But he may not have. But anyway, he fell down as if he were dead. But he laid, Jesus laid his right hand on me, saying to me, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. That's what we talked about last weekend. He was dead, he's alive, and he's alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Hades is the Greek word for hell. I have the keys to hell and to death. In other words, I have a way for people not to have to go to hell and not to have to die a spiritual death, but to live forever. Now, what I want to look at in John's story, I want to look at three things. Here's what I'm wanting you to do. I'm wanting you to get a fresh revelation of Jesus. And in John's story, that's what I'm going to look at. First point, John had a revelation of Jesus. Would you agree with me after reading that? In, in Revelation, what he just wrote, that he had a fresh revelation of Jesus. He did. And Jesus said, I am he who is dead, I'm alive forevermore. He had an encounter with Jesus after the ascension. Mary Magdalene had an encounter with him before the ascension, but, but he's having this encounter. It is incredible what happens to John. Now, let me give you a little background on John. When, when the book of John is written, he's the only living original disciple. He's the only one alive. All the other disciples have been martyred or died. John's the only disciple that was not killed. Now, the book of Acts tells us uh, in chapter 12 that Herod the king, he stretched out his hand against the church, harassed the church, and Herod killed James, the brother of John, with his sword. History also tells us that, that, and we believe it was the emperor Nero who crucified Peter, and Peter wanted to be crucified upside down. Uh, And so we, we believe John is the only one left. 
So I'm going to give you some things in this message, not just from the scripture, but I'm going to give you some historical documents of the facts of history in the Jewish history. History tells us that they tried to kill John. They, they tried to martyr John. He wouldn't die. They put him in a pot of boiling oil, and while he's in this boiling oil, he's preaching Christ to them. His skin's not burned. He would not die. And when the emperor, and we think it's Nero, when he heard about this, he's afraid of him, so he puts him on this island called Patmos. He's on the island for one year, and while he's there, he writes the book of Revelation, the last chapter in the New Test the last book in the New Testament. The passage we just read is John having a vision of Revelation while he's on that island. Now, there are two theories about John's mother and father. And, and I'll give you these. I, I believe the second theory, but I'll give you both. The first theory is that Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, was married before he married Mary. His first wife died, but they had a daughter named Salome. And this would have been Jesus' half-sister, Salome, married Zebedee, and they had John. Uh, so if, if that's the case, then John was a half, would have been a half-nephew of Jesus. Most believe, most theologians believe, that Salome was Mary's sister. Salome married Zebedee. And, he ha and they had John, who was a cousin of Jesus, and Salome was Mary's sister. That's why we believe in John 2 at the wedding of Cana that, that this was John's wedding, and that's why Jesus is there, that's why his mother is Mary's there, you know, and that's why she's so involved with the family running out of food, running out of wine, because it, it was her family, okay? We believe that John was related to Jesus, so he knew him from the very beginning. If he's family, he's known him all his life on the earth, and, and, and he had many encounters with him, but not like the one on the Isle of Patmos. So we have John's gospel. We have four gospels. We have John's gospels. It is like none of the other gospels. When someone says, where do I start reading the Bible? Read the book of John. But get a translation you can understand, that you can, that you can pull from. New Living Translation, NIV, whatever. Read a translation you can understand. But it's like no other gospel or any other book in the Bible. It even begins differently other than the book of Genesis. It, it begins like Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus had a revelation of God. John had a revelation that Jesus was God. And so then he writes the Gospel of John because he wants people to understand he's not just the Messiah. He's also the Son of God, and he's also God. Now, there, John just felt like that needed to be nailed down. I'll explain it more in a minute. There are two doctrines that were under attack then, and they're under attack today. It's called the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. John had a greater revelation of the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus than any of the other disciples because he writes the gospel of John to prove the divinity of Jesus. He writes 1 John to prove the humanity of Jesus. I'll give you an example. 1 John 4, 3. Here's what he wrote. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. In 1 John 1, 1, he writes, that which was from the beginning, he's talking about Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The reason he's writing this is he, he lived a long time. He, many believe he died in 98 AD. Most believe he lived over 100 AD. We do know that he was well over 100 years old when he did die. During this time, he's watching the church, and he's starting to see things in the church that begin to bother him, and that's the reason he writes 1 John and 2 John and 3 John. And, and, and of course, the book of Revelation is a direct commandment. We read it. You, you see this, you write this down. And then Jesus said, write these things, and, and then he went back last, and he wrote the Gospel of John later in his life. He writes 1 John because in Ephesus they're teaching, people are saying, well, there's a, Jesus didn't really come. It's a figment of your imagination. It's a spirit. And, and John says, wait a minute, wait a minute. He writes in 1 John, I, I was there. I saw him. I touched him. I talked to him. I, I know him. He was the only disciple left living that could do that, and that's the reason he wrote 1 John. I'm a firsthand witness, and, and, and that's what he said. You know, you've probably been in situations like I have with other pastors. Uh, pastors do this. People, you don't do this, but we do this sometimes. You know, they were at a conference or at a meeting, and man, did, did you hear what happened at this? And I had that happen once, and I said, uh, that, that's not what happened. Oh, yeah, that's what I heard happen. Well, no, that's not what happened. Well, how do you know? Well, I was there. 
And that's not what happened. So John is able to say, he's, he's able to say, I, I was there. I, I know what happened. I know he was real. He was not a figment of your imagination. And, and, and I saw him. So John had a revelation of Jesus. Second point, John had a growing revelation of Jesus. So watch. The book of John is incredible. Your homework assignment during this series is read the book of John. It records more of what Jesus said about himself than any other book in the Bible. So if I want to know Jesus, then I can pick up nuggets and, 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 and gems of, of insight of what he said about himself. Not just what somebody else said, but what he said about himself. Theologians refer to the book of John as the red letter edition. Now, for all you young people, that means that you can buy a Bible, and then in the New Testament where Jesus is talking, it's in red. And everything else that's in black, Jesus said also. But just some people need it in red to understand it. So it's referred to as, you know, there's more red letters in the Gospel of John than any other book. Uh, it's, it's referred to as the I am gospel. Because Jesus said, I am the bread, I am the light, I am the door, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I'm the vine, I am the son of God. He's also referred to as the love disciple. Talks about how much he loved Jesus and Jesus loved him. If John had not recorded this, where, where Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another, it's, it's nowhere else. John recorded it. If, if if John, and then he backs it up in 1 John where he says, if anyone says he loves God and doesn't love his brother, he's a liar. So, you know, he, 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 he's, he's seeing all of this. Now, here's what history tells us. History tells us and gives us an account that this took place when he's very, very old, that he goes to the temple one day, he goes in, and people recognize him, and they start saying, hey, that's the disciple John. Someone goes over to him and says, hey, would, would you share with us what it was like, what, the most what you remembered about Jesus and what he taught. And so he walks to the front in temple. He walks up and he says three words. He says, love one another. And he went and he sat down. And then they said, well, wait, wait, isn't there something else you want to tell us? I mean, isn't there more you can tell us? And he said, no, this is the new commandment our Lord gave us. Love one another. James was his brother. And, and, and we believe that Peter and Andrew, of course, they were brothers, that their father died when they were young, and, and John's father, Zebedee, took them in and, and raised them as fishermen, too. That was their trade. And, 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 and so he taught them just like his own sons, James and John. So remember, this is a growing revelation. This has been going on John's whole life. And, and, and he didn't start out being the loved disciple. He was from Galilee. He was called a Galilean. You were known by your speech, just like if you're from South Alabama, you are known by your speech. I don't know if you know this or not, but you sound different. <laughs> Re record yourself. Listen to yourself. You, you, don't, you don't sound the same, okay? You're from... So he, he, he didn't sound the same. They were considered country folk. Uh, they were considered uneducated. When Peter and John healed the, the lame man and they were put in prison... They, they said, oh, these guys are unlearned men. They, they're from Galilee. They're uneducated. But they took notice of them because they had been with Jesus. And, and this is where John comes from. He's a little bit rough around the edges. We give more attention to Simon Peter because he keeps his foot in his mouth. But John was the same way. And in fact, Jesus calls James and John the sons of thunder. Now, we, today we would think that's a compliment. I mean, that, that sounds like a, a wrestling name or something, you know. But, but it's really not a compliment when you look at it in the original language. It's like Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are a little radical and wild a little bit. You're kind of rough and radical. I'm going to help you with that. I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you this love disciple, how, how, how it looked in Luke 9, 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I, I don't sense a lot of love there for people. You, you probably have been there too where there's people where you wanted fire to come down and consume them because of what they're doing. But, and Jesus said, they're not love, he's not a love disciple yet. And Jesus had to say, you don't even know what spirit you're of. And then another case in Mark 9, 38, John answered him and saying, teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. Oh my goodness, I can't believe that. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. Today it would sound like this. Hey, we saw someone from another church using our material and preaching our sermons, and we told them they had to stop doing that. that, that that's what they were saying. James and John are the, are, are the ones who went to Jesus secretly and said, hey, when you come into the kingdom, when you sit, can we sit at the right hand? Can we be your right hand guys? They even put their mother up to it to go and ask. That, that's Jesus' aunt. Well, he can't turn his aunt down. Uh, so, so, the, so 
he, this, this is, this guy is in, he has a growing revelation. John, he, he didn't just become the, the, the disciple uh, that, that is so in love and, and pours out love on everybody. He's in transition. He wrote the book of Revelation, not plural, singular. And you, never, you will never understand the book of Revelation if you don't understand who it's about and not what it's about. Most people are intrigued and interested about what it's about. And many people think Revelation is, that it's a book of the end times, the revelation of the end times. It's not. Here's what the book of Revelation is. It says it in, in Revelation 1.1. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if you try to figure out what Revelation is, is talking about rather than whom it's talking about, you'll never understand Revelation. And remember, I want you to have Revelation from this message, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. What I'm saying is John had a growing revelation of Jesus. John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God seven, 27 times in the book of Revelation. Well, what's so big about that? Well, it's, it's, it's only in the in New Testament 31 times. And the two other times it's in the book of John. So only two times other than John was he recalled the Lamb of God. This is unbelievable understanding now that we have that Jesus is a type of the Lamb. We have all the Old Testament symbolism, but now we know that he is a type of the Lamb of God because we got it from God, from, from John. The Gospel of John is not a synoptic gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're synoptic. Synoptic means same or similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar gospels. The book of John is a book of good news, but it's not synoptic. Here's what I mean. Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote about theirs a long time before John wrote his book. And what they did is they wrote about the last year of Jesus' life, the last year of his ministry. They wrote about the birth of Jesus and the, the wilderness experience and the water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then immediately after the imprisonment of John, they, then they, they give you all these things that happened in Jesus' life. John the Baptist was put in prison after the first two years of Jesus' ministry. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke only tell us of one Passover other than the one he died in that Jesus went to in his ministry time. John tells us of three Passovers, three years. So we may not have known that Jesus was in ministry three years had it not been for John. John writes the gospel between 90 and 95 A.D. Sixty years after Jesus died, he writes this. And here's why. Because people are only reading about the third year of his ministry. And, and, and so you'll find things in John you won't find in the other Gospels. You won't, for example, the wedding of Cana, where Jesus did his first miracle, turned the water into wine. Uh, the, in John 3, the, about Nicodemus, where Jesus said, you must be born again. I did a message on this about three weeks ago. You won't find that anywhere else. We wouldn't have John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We wouldn't have the woman at the well in John 4. We wouldn't have the, in John 5 the lame man who'd been lame 38 years that Jesus healed. We wouldn't have the woman caught in adultery in, in John 8. We wouldn't have the blind man born blind that Jesus healed. We wouldn't have the raising of Lazarus from the dead. We wouldn't have the washing of the disciples' feet if it weren't for John. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Because he had a growing revelation of Jesus, he writes about this 60 years after Jesus dies on the cross. His revelation is still growing in Christ after 60 years. My question for you to think about is this. Do you know Jesus better today than when you first met him? See, if you met him last week on Easter Sunday, do you know him better in a week? Do you know him better in a year? Do you know him better in five years, ten years? Do you know him better? Because you see, the first encounter with him is, is crucial. It's crucial to meet him. But it's not just a one-time encounter. It has to be an ongoing encounter. It's very important that we have these that we meet with Jesus and we and, and, and we grow. We grow to become a disciple. John grew to become a disciple. We have to continue to have face-in-face -face encounters with him. Now, here's where I want to land. Here's the third point. This, this is the most important part for me. John had a revelation of himself in Jesus. Now watch. He saw how Jesus saw him. It's 60 years later. But he finally saw how Jesus saw him, and he writes about it. He writes the gospel of John 60 years later. In John 13, where I ask you to turn, verse 23, he starts writing this, and here's what he says. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. He's, he's referring to himself. He doesn't say John, but that's who he's talking about, himself. In John 20 and 2, look at this on the screen. Then she, Mary Magdalene, ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. 
John 21, 7, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And John 21, 20, then Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper. John 19, 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, in, 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 on the other side of this, if you look at this, you may think, well, John really has this attitude like he's the number one guy. He's in the first seat. He's the starting quarterback. He's, he's the number one guy. Of, of the 12, he's the main guy. But, but you see, it doesn't work that way. We have to understand Scripture and understand how it's written. In fact, do, do you know that the Bible says Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth? Do you know who wrote that? Moses. <laughs> yeah, he, he wrote that. John just wrote the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. See, but it's not a comparative He's not saying he loved me, but not the others. Here, here's what he's saying. I finally figured out, watch, 60 years, I finally figured out that he loved me. I figured out Jesus loves me. Now, you're, you're going to see why we need a revelation of this. He had a revelation of Jesus, and we need that revelation. He saw him as Lord, but he saw him as the Lamb. At the conversation of the Last Supper in John 14, 15, and 16, no one else recorded, and I said it last weekend. This is what Jesus said. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, also believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go away, I'll come again and receive you to myself. Jesus tells the disciples, I, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send another like me, and he's going to comfort you and help you, and he's going to bring remembrance of all things I said. And, and, he, and they did. They, they remembered things because of the Holy Spirit. John 17 is the prayer that Jesus prays in the garden. Now, here's what Jesus would do. Many times he would take Peter, James, and John, and he'd say, hey, guys, come go with me. He'd take them to Jairus' house, and the daughter's dead in the bedroom. They go in the bedroom. He raises her from the dead. He, he would call these three guys in and say, uh, come go with me. We're going up on, the, on this mountain, and we call it the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus talks to Moses and Elijah. And then he tells these same three guys, hey, come with me to the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to go pray. And then when he gets there, he says, come closer. Come closer. He wants somebody to hear the prayer. He wants somebody to record the prayer. Guess who recorded it? John. John 17. It's the prayer in the, in, in the garden. And here's what Jesus prayed. Lord, I pray that they will be one as you and I are one. I, I pray that they will know that you love them as much as you love me. Do you know that Jesus loves you as much as as God loves you? Do, you, do you, do you know that God loves you as much as he does Jesus? And, and, and I pray that they will know that you love me as much as you love, as you love them. And, and I pray that they will love one another because by this world, they will know that they are my disciples. What did Jesus say? Love one another. How will people know we're his disciples? Because we love one another. Peter and James fall asleep. Not John. What does John do? He listens. He's writing. At the Last Supper, John is leaning on his breast. Why? To hear every word Jesus says. But he doesn't write it down until 60 years later. How can he remember all that 60 years later? I, I have, remem have problems remembering something yesterday. Do you? I mean, he's remembering this for 60 years. Why, why do he, how could he remember? Because he kept having encounters with Jesus. He kept meeting the Lord. I, I, he kept having daily encounters with Jesus. How did this disciple called a son of thunder who wanted to call down fire from heaven on people who in his older age could only say, love one another, how did he make that transformation? Because he kept having face-to-face -face meetings with God. And we can have face-to-face -face meetings with God. What happens is he sees himself as Jesus sees him. I don't think we have that revelation I think most of us have missed that revelation that, G, that the way Jesus sees us, that Jesus loves us. He didn't write it until he's in his 90s. It's amazing. I mean, l listen, it, 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 it is, it's difficult for us to understand that he loves us. It's hard for us to receive it. It took him 60 years. I'll, I'll use this illustration. 
How many of you remember high school? A couple of you. Y'all drop out or what? <laughs> you probably saw a couple like this in high school. One of the most beautiful girls in the school, homecoming queen, a cheerleader, whatever. And she's dating this guy for a couple of years who's this big macho guy. And he's full of himself. And when she's with him, you, you see them together all the time. And when she's with him, her, her head's kind of down because he puts her down and makes jokes about her. And she has no self confidence, no self esteem. And finally, she breaks up with this guy. And then she meets another guy in high school. And this guy treats her right. And he says to her one day, you know, you are the most beautiful woman in the world. And she just breaks and weeps and cries. He says, you're gorgeous. And she, she's never, she can't receive that because she's listened to this abusive, controlling voice. She doesn't know she's beautiful. She doesn't know how attractive she is. See, I think that's where a lot of us are as believers. We, we don't know how beautiful we are to Jesus. We think we have to measure up and earn and work our way into a place where maybe he likes us, maybe he doesn't. The world we live in, there's so much measure, so, so much is measured that makes us acceptable in our society by this, this, and this. And I could list all these things that we know what they are. Not with Jesus. Not with Jesus. See, what John learned after 60 years, he loves me. He loves me. Can, can you receive that? He, he, he loves me. Can, or, or is your head dropped? You know, is, is your head dropped by the abusive voice of the enemy or of the past? Your countenance falls. Is that you? Are you the disciple whom Jesus loved? Well, if you're, if, you, if you're a believer in Christ, he loves you that much. And you can keep having those encounters with him time after time. And I don't think we have that revelation. And I don't think we have to wait 60 years to get it. I think we have to understand that when Jesus looks at us, he sees us in beauty and splendor. He loves us. I, I'll tell you how hard it is. Uh, look, just try this with me. Just say this out loud, not, not real out loud, but out loud, because I want you to hear yourself say it. I want you to say it out loud. Jesus loves me. Try, try this. Jesus thinks I'm beautiful. I know that rubs against you, doesn't it? Like, I can't hardly say that. Jesus loves me. That sounds like a child would say something like that. See, I think we miss out on the full revelation of who he really is because we don't realize we're the disciple whom Jesus loved. I, I, I know that what we're going to do is really simple. And it may be considered childish, but sometimes it's the childish things that we need to do. Just take your hand, put it over your heart. Now this song should come back to you. If it doesn't, you're really old. Okay? Uh, I want you to sing it out loud. As soon, soon as Brian starts, you're going to know the song. So I, I want you to sing it out loud. Everybody, every campus. Ready? Let's go. Jesus loves me, this I know. Come on, sing it. For the Bible tells me so. Sing it out. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Now we 
your hand on your heart, will you just close your eyes? You may have been listening to me and maybe you realize you're the one that can't lift your head. You're the one that that abusive voice from the pads keeps pressing you down. And you, <clears throat> you're having a hard time receiving that he thinks you're beautiful. You're having a hard time receiving that Jesus loves me. He loves me. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Or maybe you've never met Jesus and you've never received. You just went through some prayer, a, a, a rote memory, or, or, or you just said some prayer, but he, you never had that encounter in your heart like John had. You never had a revelation of how much he loves you. And if that's you, I, I want to lead you in a prayer. If that's you, I want you to just lift your hand. Lift your other hand. Lift your hand hands all over the room. I want us to pray this together, everyone. Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know I'm not lovable sometimes, but that doesn't change how you see me. You see me as beautiful, gorgeous, and I thank you for loving me. Live in my heart. Let me love other people with the same love that you love me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The presence of the love of the Father is so real right now. And for someone, you're aching and you're hurting. And you need to hear his voice. See, I can tell you all day long, but when Jesus tells you in here, it changes everything about you. And I just want you to know that he's trying to tell you in here, I love you. I love you. I love you. Lord, thank you for your presence, your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.